So this is Baruch Fleischman here at the Tikkun Elevator Kolo. We've been discussing uh, the last year the Jewish communities in the Holy Land from between the 12th and the 14th centuries. And I didn't really dwell on these pictures, so look, I'll look at them a little bit more closely. Uh, what you see is, and we'll see in a map in a minute, uh, an idea of what Jerusalem was like. The synagogue established by Nachmanides when he came to Jerusalem from Barcelona after the dispute, disputation and the debate that took place there, and he saw that there was no way for him to survive. He left, and uh, he went to Eretz Rome. And uh, the synagogue that was established by him, they call him Nachmanides here, which is really the, uh, I guess, the, the Latinized version of his name was Moshe ben Nachman. Upon his arrival in Jerusalem, apparently a crusader's structure, this is something built by crusaders. Now, you have to imagine a Middle Eastern country, uh, which is basically a desert, with a few towns in it. And those are places that are either by the water, or in some way, or by the ocean. Uh, and Jerusalem, of course, is the place that the Christians wanted to, wanted to focus on. And so here he says it's apparently a crusader structure in the middle of something built by the crusaders, and this is all stone in a hot, hot place. And Nachmanides was in there. Now, the interior of the Nachmanides synagogue, which goes back, we say, like, you know, it's like a thousand years ago. The interior of, of the Nachmanides synagogue with restored pillars. So this is what it looked like. I always have these domed insides. Now, here was a little drawing that we didn't get a chance to look at. And this, let me see if I could turn it sideways. Does that help? This, uh, let's try to get oriented. This is Hebron, and here's Jerusalem. Now, you're looking at it sideways. But it wants to show you that here is, is uh, in Gaza, there are also ports. Ashkelon, there were, these are ports. These are places where people can make a living there in trading of different types, fishing, different kinds of crafts possibly to be able to make in there. We have no details on that here. But he says that from these paths, this from different ways, we have re all making their way to Jerusalem through this desert, deserted area, is Rabbi Yehuda HaHarizi. He traveled here and he went to the next big areas of settlement, which are in Akko. Akko, once again, on the, to uh, on the, on the coast. And then all the, the places in here, the Tiveria, which is important, and Sipori, you have to be able to read side, uh, sideways a little bit. These are all places that he went. Also, this Rebbe Betatahaya, I'm not sure exactly how you would pronounce it in Hebrew, was a similar, similar route, not exactly the same. He went right through Judea and Samaria, and he wound up in Akko again, and then wherever they went from there. But this was the main settlements because as we're going to see a little bit of a map, it's not this map of uh, that was taken at the time before we get to the subject of the Jews of Italy. So this is Jerusalem in the 12th century. This is from J. Prower, a history of the Crusader kingdom. So this gives you an idea. It's not a big place. Let me just see what it is. Basically, it's an area of walled area. Now, we have no particular notes, but let's look at the, uh, these are the entrances. These are gates into the walls. I don't know if they correspond to what we have now. I don't, this is not a history of that. But this is just to give you an idea on top of this, of this mountain, which, which in the Bible is called Mount Moriah. He says that the top of this mountain is Jerusalem. And that's as big as Jerusalem was. So here's the, I think if we looked at it closely, we'd find the different churches, the Church of Holy Sepulchre, and other different kinds of things that are found in this area. Uh, we don't see the the uh, the mosques, the big mosques. We don't see that in this drawing, but it gives you an idea of how isolated any settlement was in Israel at this time. Now, uh, let's move back and... We're going to get a little idea about what was going on in Italy, right? Because uh, many people hold that the origin of the Ashkenaz Jews came from the Jews of Italy, who some intermarried, 
So we're very close to the Italian people physically. The Ashkenaz Jews look a lot like Italians and vice versa. And the basic uh, friction that exists between many Jews and many other uh, nationalities is not so strong with the Italians at all. I live in Bo Boca Raton here, was originally a very large American Italian fa uh, area and still is. And you see a lot of people who are intermarried from here. It's uh, very, very unusual. So anyway, these are the papal states. So this is Italy. And Italy is divided up into all different kinds of little kingdoms. They're all chopped up into different places, all these different cities. Here's Corsica, these are the large island off the coast. Sardinia, which is also part of Italy. And then we have Sicily, Sicilia over there. And so we, here we have all these places in Italy and its influences up here in Milano. Pavia, and I don't know, all the Verona, some of these names I know, all the way over to this way, and this is even really into what I call uh, Yugoslavia. So it, all of this is part of the Italian area, and let's see what Dr. Beinart says in regards to this. He says, Jewish life in Italy in the 12th and 13th centuries was determined by a constantly fluctuating political climate with the church promulgating anti-Jewish laws, really. Most of the Jewish population was located from the center of the Italian peninsula southward. Rome was an important Jewish center, while cities such as Lucca, Pisa, and, ben ben and Venice had sparse Jewish populations. Now this name, Yehiel Anav, which means Yehiel the, the humble, a relative of Nathan ben Yehiel, supervised the finances of Pope Alexander III. So Jews, Jews, always involved with numbers, with financing. The significant, significant political events of this period were the Hohenstaufen rule in Sicily. Now, who are the Hohenstaufens? They, the Angevin invasion of, of Italy at the invitation of both, uh, Pope Boniface, uh, maybe it's Boniface, I'm not sure, number 8, 1294-1303, and the wars of the Aragonese this dynasty over the rule of south-central Italy. Jews gave financial aid to the war campaigns of the Aragonese. Now this is like what you see in a lot of of European history that we're going to see that the Jews find themselves in the middle between warring factions and basically we have this now too. So here we have the, uh, but it's not at war at the moment, is the Democrats and the Republicans. You have Jews that back both sides. So one side wins in Europe, that could be very bad for us, but also the other side wins, then it could be that if the side we support, then it would be good. It just kept going on and on like that for its part. The church had already established its attitude towards Jews. At the Third Lateran Council, which was in the, in the year 1179, and the Fourth Lateran Council in the year 1215, a number of anti-Jewish edicts were issued, among them a decree that Jews must dress so as to be easily distinguished from Christians. Now, a reaction to this, which continued on for the next 600 years, 700 years, uh, the reaction to this is what produced Hasidism, if anybody's familiar with Hasidim. So if you want us to look different, we'll stick it in your face. That's their, uh, that's their idea. We'll dress like this, that nobody dresses like that, and you'll know that we're Jewish. So that's... I'm just repeating like an, what I see as an attitude. The distinction soon became institutionalized in the Jewish badge. So we had to have, wear a star. The council also limited the maximum rate of interest that Jews could charge children, uh, Christians because the Jews were in a money lending business. This period is also noted for the blood libels in Trani, where in 1291-90, one such blood libel resulted in four synagogues being converted into churches. The popularization of the Gabola in Italy began to bear fruit. Bari and Otranto became important centers of Torah study. So that's very interesting. 
that with the Italians and in Italy is really where you see the rise of Torah study, of Kabbalah, meaning the Zohar and others. This is Baruch Fleischmann at the Tikkun Elevator Kolo, Dr. Chaim Beinart, Jewish history, how we survived the Middle Ages.